Hi! Good morning everyone. Happy Saturday morning to all of us. I'm Winnie Diola, a grade 5 science teacher and currently the education technology coordinator for grade school and the brother Rafael Donato Knight High School at De La Salle Santiago Isabel School. So thank you Network Learning PH for having me here again. This is my second time. And I do hope that all the teachers this morning is feeling um, we're all okay. And I do hope that you're getting your much needed rest. So just sit back and relax and enjoy the, the series of sessions that NLPH prepared for all of you this morning. Okay, so another question that I would like to ask is, what's filling your bucket today? and what's draining it. It's very important to reflect on a Saturday morning. So I'm sure these are uh, all the things that you have in your mind are all important, but it's let's prioritize our well-being. Let's have a break. Let's enjoy our weekend. Okay, so may I start now? Thank you. So for this morning, I'll talk about maintaining connections with learners in the distance learning environment. So our learning targets, there are two, just like our students, we have our learning targets. So let's identify the different ways of connecting with students in an online distance learning environment and to identify activities that can promote active student engagement in order for them to be connected with, with us, right? So... Okay, we all know that the, the normal thing is that students will be staying at the home. They will be learning at the comforts of their home. And it's really um, exciting for the teachers to be teaching online, right? So we're really experiencing, in our school, we are experiencing this kind of um, normal because we're now on our third month. Yes, we started July 3 with our pure online distance learning and then eliminating unit assessment and then the next is the performance task so and then after a week or two we'll start with our second term so that's for us it's really normal for the teacher to be in front of the camera talking and uh, holding uh, synchronous sessions uh, virtually and then doing a synchronous session with with the students in the afternoon. That's the kind of normal thing for our teachers now. And some of you will just be experiencing this normal in the coming uh, October, right? So October. Okay, but being in the comforts of our homes would mean there are so many distractions. And if there are so many distractions, if the teachers get distracted because you are at the comforts of your home, sometimes you see that, oh, mandumi naman, maglilinis ako. Or, oh, I need to do the other things. Then you become distracted. Then you can just imagine that a lot of distractions will be present in front of our students. Even the use of mobile devices will be considered a distraction if not properly used. So when there are so many distractions, what are we going to do? The next thing we know, it's the challenge of involving our students, engaging our students with, with our subject with our content and it's going to be challenging for the teachers to come up with activities that will really uh, get students attention because also and peterson said that student engagement refers to the degree of attention curiosity interest value and perseverance that students show when they are learning or being taught but if there are so many distractions then that would mean they become inattentive because they are, tend to focus more on the discussion and not on your, that they tend to focus more on the distraction and not on your discussion. So with that, we keep on looking for some things in order to make sure that, that there would be an increase in the engaged student engagement. So it's really challenging for the teachers when you think of that. But there are some ways, but of course, if adults get distracted, students get distracted the younger learners get distracted also and we all know that students who are engaged 
learn at high levels as mentioned by Philip Sklecti and have a profound grasp of what they learn, retain what they learn, and they can transfer what they learn to new contexts. Now, if they are not engaged, how will they be able to transfer all the things that you will they that you are teaching them into a new context how will they be able to demonstrate their own understanding if they real, did not learn anything due to so many distractions that they have at right now uh, at the moment so the big question now is how will our students see as meaningful um, the, these activities as meaningful and what might they see as pointless because there are so many uh, students will be asking us now that, Miss, there are so many things that you want us to accomplish. Is this graded? Do I really need to do, to do all, all of these things? Because these students will be thinking that at this time of the pandemic, these are the things that I'm experiencing at home. So what's the relevance of the things that you're asking me to do if it's not really connected to what's happening to me in my own homes? In my own life so we need to take note of that we want to uh, look at the activities that we prefer so that it can have a meaning it will be a meaningful learning experience for our students okay the good thing what I really like about the online distance learning because we've been into blended learning uh, um, we've been using the blended learning approach the pedagogy we're in we make use of we combine the seamless uh, and have a seamless integration of face-to-face -face instruction and the use of technology in the classroom. But it's really difficult for us to achieve the idea of personalizing um, instruction. But with this kind of setup now, we were able to step up and come up with some activities that will really allow for some personalization. How? Because we try to come up with activities wherein we provide flexible content and tools. So with this kind, with uh, when we allow differentiation, we try to look at the learning preferences of our students. So when we give a lesson, we provide them the content, then give them the options. How do, how do they want to learn? Do they want to read an article? Do they want to watch a, a video clip? Do they want to write something to show their understanding? Then we need to give all those um, um, ideas that they are allowed to follow their learning preferences in order to learn the content. And they are allowed to use some tools to show their own learning. So that's a good thing about uh, allowing some personalization in, in learning and teaching. Then since we want to do the chunking because um, due to the um, limited time that we allotted for different, so many topics that we have for this academic year, we want to have a targeted instruction. So we do the chunking of lessons, right? So we try to identify the, the specific um, competencies that really stu uh, the students need and at the same time try to come up with achievable learning goals. So since we do the chunking, we try to, uh, we ask our students to accomplish tasks, right, uh, at least week for a uh, weekly basis. Oh, that's good because it's manageable for them. Then the other one that, that I really like is we want to have data-driven decisions. So from time to time, we'll be asking our students to uh, answer uh, some forms and then identify their challenges. And then we also do the self-assessments and then find out if the students are learning. They also do their, um, we want our students to reflect and own the responsibility so, so that they can learn they can learn at the comforts of their home. So when we do that, we give them the avenue we want them to reflect. Why do you think you were able to achieve and accomplish the learning goals this week? What happened? Why you did not accomplish your, your tasks assigned this week? So allow the students um, um, room for this kind of reflection so that they will be able to own. They will not say, oh, because I wasn't able to study because my mom is not around. 
right? So I wasn't able to learn it because my teacher did not teach well. So these are some of the things that you will be hearing. But if you give the students the the purpose and you give them the goals and allow them to track and monitor their own goals, then they become responsible and then they own their learning as well. Okay, so that's the good thing about the online distance learning at, at this time of the pandemic. And of course, because we are giving them uh, different avenues on how they want to learn and what to learn and what uh, tech tools or platforms to use to showcase their learning, then what we are actually do is the idea of the personalized learning wherein we amplify the student's voice and choice. So giving them the options is really one way of allowing the students to make their own decisions, to have their own direction on how they want to learn. So when you amplify students' voice and choice, you give them the options to um, accomplish their learning goals at their own time, at their own path, and at their own pace. So we usually give them a week, right, to accomplish the task. So with that, they will be able to learn how to manage their own time as well. So in our school, we're using the learning playlist. So a learning playlist is one of the blended learning models that we learned from the Christensen Institute. Uh, it's like an um, uh, individual station rotation. So you give the students the list of activities that they need to accomplish for the week. It's really up to, uh, it's really up to them when they want to accomplish it as long as you have pro provided them the the time where when they're supposed to submit all these tasks and then we give them the pacing you have a week it's it's up to you you want to accomplish everything during the asynchronous session in the afternoon because we have asynchronous session in the afternoon or you want more time and accomplish it some other time over the weekend then we do understand that and another thing that i really like about our learning playlist is giving the students the option on the path that they want to follow in order to achieve their learning goals so the teachers will be providing either tutorial videos or or um, textbooks or other digital materials and then ask the students to um they they have the choice uh, what do you want to 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 do in order to learn these things or to reinforce the 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 concepts that you have learned then the students will choose oh i want to read more in my using my textbook and then the others oh I, i'll just watch the videos provided by the teachers so they have their own path now so we are really empowering our students to learn on their own. So we have learned the term, the terms asynchronous and asynchronous learning, asynchronous and asynchronous learning, right? So to make it simpler uh, for our students, we tell them when is it asynchronous, it means that anytime learning, this is when you do the independent uh, study, then the teacher will actually provide them um, materials it's it's really a combination of digital and printed materials especially for the for the grade school so we still ask them to have their notebooks their physical textbooks and there are some activities that they need to perform uh, using our learning management system then Talking about a learning management system, if you are in a remote learning or a distance learning setup, it's very important that you have your learning management system. But if you don't have that kind of budget, then just look for the free LMS. For, for example, if you're, um, you're using the G Suite for education, Google Classroom is free. There is a, a free version of CISO. Um, there's Microsoft Teams and there's Kuluchi also. So you can choose from all of this. But these four learning management systems are being used in our school. The CISO is for the lower grades. That's how we communicate and that's how we maintain the connection with our students in school. Then, as I've mentioned, it's very important that you have the back channel app just in case you get disconnected or the student gets disconnected. So for us, we're using the Google Hangouts because it's using our student um, Gmail account. Okay? But of course, you can choose Viber or, or any other messaging apps. 
At the beginning of our academic year, we try to identify our core four. So we try to minimize the platforms and tech tools that we'll be introducing to our students, especially in the grade school. So we either focus on the use of Google Drive, then the teacher will use Google Slides for presentation, and then we have the Google Classroom, and for assessment, formative assessment, we use our the Google Forms. But if you feel that you're into um, Microsoft, then you can introduce the OneDrive and then the OneNote, then use Microsoft Forms and Microsoft Teams as your platform. But what is really important here is to identify the core four. And for the first term, try to just use this four, this core four. So it's easy to manage for, for our students, for the parents, and for the teachers as well. Now this one is the highlight, the Screencastify extensions. Um, this one is very useful. Uh, These apps or, or extensions are really useful to our teachers now because we said that in order to maintain connections with our students, it's very important that the students always see their teacher okay, anytime that they want. So meaning if the teacher will create tutorial videos and upload it in the learning management system, then the students will be able to watch the teacher several times in a day. So let's say um, there's a math computation, but uh, the student couldn't remember it. All he has to do is to go back to the learning management system and check the, the video of the teacher, play it again, and there. So even they are at the homes without the help of their teachers, if the teacher has a tutorial videos, then the students will get help even 24 seven. Okay, so you can use Loom, sorry for this, the Screencast-O-Matic, Screencastify, or the QuickTime plus the, the PowerPoint. So from time to time, I've mentioned it's very important that we have the strategic pause. So ask the students to turn on their camera and then ask questions. So how do you feel? So is it still okay? Um, will I continue or are you confused now? Are there any questions that you would like to ask or do I need to stop? Because I need to uh, explain the, the, the difficulty that you encountered. So you can ask that to your students also. So I'll just continue now. Then the other term that we always hear in the distance um, learning is the synchronous le uh, learning or synchronous session. So when we say synchronous, it's the real-time learning that can happen when you together with your classmates and teachers, that's how we tell it to our students when they are working together using the Google Meet because that's our official uh, multimedia conferencing tools. Then another big question that we have here is, how can I keep my students actively engaged with other students, with my content or with my lesson and with me? while in the online distance learning. So we want them not just to be connected with one another, we want them to be very engaged with the materials that you provide. We want them to be engaged in the discussions that we do online, and we want them to be engaged with the material even though that they are working asynchronously. So these are some of the exciting things that we need to think of as we prepare for prepare with our materials for our students, right? So we'll just focus on the three. So how how do how can we maintain the connection of the con our content, our lesson with the with our students? Or how can we maintain the connection of all of these students together and how they can be connected with us, their teachers. So the first one is we all know when we hear the term ODL, remote learning, the students will be thinking about, oh, it's all about reading and listening to lectures, watching videos. Why would they be thinking that way? It's because imagine if there are two videos in one subject and you have 11 subjects in a week, would that mean I will be watching 22 videos and I will be reading hundreds of pages of textbooks? So the other that's the reason why some students really feel unmotivated because they are just thinking of the things that they need to accomplish, the boring things that they need to do because the teacher says so. 
Okay, so try to break that idea because let's, for example, you're in a modular approach, you will be giving digital materials or physical materials to your students, but how are you going to present it, these lessons that it would, that would create meaningful learning experience to our students? So for example, you have a lesson, um, this one is for grade four. So try to contextualize the materials. You're talking about properties of matter, but you cannot do the experiment experiments in, in, in the classroom unlike uh, you used to do. So will that stop you as a science teacher? No. So try to look for some materials and then ask and then tell them with adult supervision, try to collect the materials and be ready with, with uh, these materials for our synchronous session. And then later on, you work together while you are online, then you can do that. Now, if you tell me it's modular, so they will be working on their own, just make sure that all those materials are ready, that can be readily available at home. So, para namang hindi challenging dun sa mga parents to, to prepare also. Then, later on, um, the common mistake that uh, some people will be thinking that if it's remote learning it's always online but it's not so if it's remote or distance learning even us we're in the pure online distance learning environment we don't do everything online we don't always yes we always have our mobile devices in order to connect through our meeting, uh, the multimedia conference tool. But there are some activities that we ask our students uh, similar to the one I've showed you. I ask them to prepare the, the plastic container and because we want to show weathering and erosion, uh, weathering. So I ask them to come up to bring uh, some crackers like sky flakes or similar to that one. And then a plastic container and then together we try to shake it to show that, that just to simulate how weathering occurs okay in rocks so we can always do that so it's not always coming up with online activities or the use of tech tools okay so you can use your textbook so maximize the use of textbooks uh, teach the students how to highlight important terms in in your textbook then that, that's why I included here. If you are in a modular approach, you will be sending digital copies or physical copies to your students. So just please make sure that there's a space where the students can actually write down their notes as they read or as they learn some activities in, in your um, modules. So are you still okay? I hope you're still okay. And then another thing is, um, aside from uh, interacting with your course content through those uh, examples I have given you, or for example, you can do the online. So let's say you're like us in a pure online distance learning setup, then you can tweak some of the Google form activities in your Google Forms. So this one is made by Miss Kathleen when uh, the grade six students are learning about the circulatory system and she prepared the learning playlist this way that it looks interactive and then, then the students will really have uh, different materials in one so you can watch a video there's the gif then there's an article that you can read so the students can actually choose from the playlist then i like this one the students really enjoy doing the digital escape room or it's really a, just an interactive worksheet but you try to gamify it and then it seems like there's a story that they need to accomplish and if they get the correct answer so it's there success you cross the canyon safely and then you can move on to the next question so if they get incorrect if they uh, answered it incorrectly then they will just go back and try to solve it again. So uh, try that, it's the digital escape room. And also another way to be connected is to help the students uh, be connected with your content as well. So usually at the end of the week, we provide some um, Google Sheets so to identify the understanding of my the students of the lesson, then they can also have the self-assessment to identify what worked this week and what didn't work. 
to the, the reasons why you were able to accomplish the task and why you didn't accomplish the task, you can write them down. Or you can put it in the reflection log. So these are the things that I did that worked for, for this week and maybe I can improve my, my um, study my study habit next week to achieve this goal. So we can encourage our students to, to do that also. Then another, uh, uh, there's one tech tool that uh, we really love using during our synchronous session. It's a Pear Deck. I'm sure you have heard about the Pear Deck. So there's the free version and it's working for us, just the free version. So you don't need to worry. So there are so many prompts that you can use automatically. Uh, it's ready just in case there are some ideas that you want to highlight. So you can just, just choose some prompts and ask the students. With this um, tech tool, with this um, Chrome extension, the all students have the opportunity to answer. And like before, only those who are raising their hands or only those who are not raising their hands will be called by the teacher. But with the use of the pair deck or the slide or the other one that I'll be showing you, the students have the opportunity to, all of them, they okay, have the opportunity to answer. Okay, so that, this one is the one I'm telling you, the, the Slido. So uh, the, the Slido is really um, similar to Pear Deck, but what I like about the Slido is you can have your, your live poll. So you can have the multiple choice, the open text. There's the word cloud also similar to Mentimeter. And then you can actually, um, these are some... Things that will make your student very active and engaged during your synchronous session. When when it happens, then you can feel that they are connected with your content. And at the same time, they are connected with you because they are so excited to share the results of their their answers. Okay? And then when you do the word um the word cloud, similar I've mentioned similar to Mentimeter, so the one with the big a uh, font would mean a number of students answered that term. That's the student's view. Uh, we ask our students to use the app because it's easier to manipulate. So they can have text or long responses. And they can even ask you some questions at the end. So you can allow them to ask questions using Slido. Then Nearpod is good, but of course, there's a paid version for Nearpod. But some of our teachers are using the free version. There are so many activities that you can use for free. So you can try it out. But this one, what I really like about Nearpod now, it has an extension in Google Slides. So all you have to do is to create the materials in your Google Slides and then open it in or convert it in the Nearpod. So imagine that you can include videos, you can collaborate. There's, it has its own um, um, board that looks like the Padlet that you can use to, so that students can collaborate. Then you can ask your students to draw their answers. You can embed the Flipgrid or you want to, to include some poll or quizzes or you want some um, activities, uh, videos, then you can include that within the near pod. It's nice, right? Yeah? So it's, um, it's also a good one. It's a good extension to the design. So that's the near pod. The other one that, there, um, that our, our teachers like to use is the class flow. So the class flow, you can create your own multiple choice. There are some assessments also uh, readily available, but the teachers like creating their own activities. So one of the activities that I enjoy uh, doing in the class flow is the word search. And then you can give that class code to your students and then they can join and then all of them are really working and trying to identify the answers. So with that, the students are very much connected with my lesson, right? Then Wiser is, it's a digital worksheet. So if you have the opportunity to make you, uh, to create digital worksheet, Wiser is a good app for that. Now, I'm sure you've heard about Edpuzzle. Now, my challenge only with Edpuzzle is uh, sometimes it's lagging, uh, maybe because I'm using the free version. But the idea of Edpuzzle is really good because just like I've mentioned, it's very important the students get help. 
Hey, there are so many challenges, there are so many distractions at home, and I'm sure their parents are also working. So we need more teachers to, to help the students at home. So with the Ed Puzzle, you're giving the options, uh, the students to watch the video, to have a review, answer it. It could be a formative assessment. If they make a mistake, then you can set there that they need to go back and watch that part again and answer the questions again. So that can happen. That one is a good um, way of providing materials to our students because there will be more and more teachers at, uh, at their own homes. And like before, if you watch a video, you don't know what to do, you will just answer the questions given by the teacher and you're not even sure if the answers are correct. But with the use of Edpuzzle or Google Forms, you get the automatic response with feedback, right? So, and also if you are one more or you're a um, person who's into vlogging, then maybe you can use the content that you have created and then I just upload it in the Edpuzzle, right? Oh, that's how I integrate the, those are the scores for my students and I usually integrate it with my Google Classroom. Another favorite um, app that I have here is the, the Voyager Google Earth. So there's so many articles, there's so many stories that you can uh, um, share with your students. Uh, this one I shared it with my, my students when we were talking about the alternative energy resources. So they really enjoyed seeing that in so many parts of the world they actually have a more advanced um, wind farm or more advanced uh, alternative energy resources. So they get to be, they, they become very inspired when they create their own prototypes or their own designs also. Okay, there are some modules or lessons that you can uh, it's a, you can explore or find some lessons in the Voyager. So if you're an English teacher or social studies teacher, you can actually get some materials from Voyager. Ang ganda niya. Okay, then the other one is the Google Earth. We're using Google Earth. I like Google Earth. Imagine when I introduced myself at the beginning of the school academic year, I used that one. So I was showing my story to my students as I explained my, I, I introduced myself. So you can actually do that in your own class. So the students get to be excited and say, Ooh, Miss Winnie, your house is just near our house, something like that. So you can, uh, it's nice. So these are some of the apps that you can actually use so that you can maintain the connection. Because when students can relate, when students um, um, get the connection um, of the things that they are learning and the things that they are seeing, they become engaged. So that's the one that we really want to, to highlight and that, that's the one that we want to achieve whenever we are teaching um, either synchronously or asynchronously. Okay, another favorite that I have is the Google Expeditions. So with Google Expeditions, you don't really need to, to uh, have the virtual reality gadget. So it only works with mobile devices. So if your students have smartphones or or tablets, then they can navigate the Google Expedition. So imagine if you're a Christian living teacher and you're talking about the places of faith. So you can use this uh, augmented reality uh, ac activity found in the in the Google Expedition. So then one that we um, I've been using this for I think for three weeks now the Jamboard. So if you check from the Google, uh, from YouTube, there are so many tutorial videos about Jamboard and it's really good. Uh, this one is, is an engagement platform. It's a digital uh, whiteboard that you can use during your synchronous session. All you have to do is to share it with your students and make it editable. But of course, it's very important that when you use Jamboard, you have to explain to the students the importance of uh, digital citizenship and etiquettes and be respectful of the work of others because since you share the editable version, you can actually, the students can actually delete or erase the work of 
others. So that one. Imagine if you can include coming from the classic flow, you get the you get the, the word search activity and then set it as image here in Jamboard, then the students can actually answer it here. They don't need to go to the, uh, they don't need to enter the class code of the class flow. They will just work as a team. And it can be a contest, it can be a group. Maybe for, for group one, you'll have this set of this Jamboard and then another group will have another copy of the Jamboard and then you, you ask them, okay, who will be able to find all the words, right? The uh, fastest so they will be looking. So you can easily identify it because you can actually check all the Jamboards using your the tabs, okay? And then if you want to have a um, um, poll activity, who agree, who disagree, where the given idea, and then you can use the Jamboard as well. And then the students can use the sticky notes to explain their um, stand. Well, for social studies there, then, okay. So in the end of the students, if they're using tablet, there are more fa uh, features that they will be able to see. There are, more, uh, there are more colors, then they can do the assistive drawing. In the assistive drawing, look, I did that uh, butterfly, but it suggested uh, several nice butterflies. That one, I drew a girl, but it showed me, I think it's a bat. <laughs> oh, it's a ballerina. Okay, so that one is good for the young learners, the assistive drawing, and there's also the assistive texts. So another um, app that I have here is the Jigspace. So if you're a science teacher and it's really challenging to teach some of these uh, lessons, then use Jigspace. Imagine talking about the layers of the earth. So it's really fun during my, my during my classroom setting. My students really enjoy studying the layers of the earth, even the earthquakes. So uh, we're in Montilupa, so earthquake-prone area. It's good that the students get the concepts on what's really happening if there's an earthquake and why is the reason why we have the earthquake drills. So these are some of the things that we discuss. Then you can talk about constellation now. The students enjoy. Now because we are in a remote learning, then we can just ask your students to have their mobile devices ready and go out at night time and really explore. Unlike before, we always do it as an assignment, right? But as I've said, I want to highlight the importance of contextualization. We need to contextualize the lessons that we get or the activities that we provide to our students so that the students will see the, the relevance and they find these activities meaningful to them. So a little bit of the stretch break. So we're just, we're almost done, but of course we've been seated for about 30 minutes. So I just hope you can move your legs, move your hands. And as a teacher, you can also do that strategic pause, but it's very important to be very, uh, be very careful if you are not properly dressed. Be sure not to stand. <laughs> okay, now another way of um, maintaining the connection with our students, as I've mentioned, you must be able to give them the idea that they can present their learning according or uh, the things that they have learned depending on their learning preference. So if the students are really good in writing journals or in blogging, or they want vlogs, then give those opportunity to our students because that's how they connect with our content. Or there are students who really love con con uh, creating podcasts. So we need to offer that also to them, that I, those options. Then some are really good in sketching or in creating videos. So that would be another option. So when we do that, we really empower our students with a voice and choice because they get to decide on how they want to show that they're learning. So before I ask my students to create prototype habitats uh, for grade five, we're talking about endangered species here in the Philippines. And then it's not just maintaining the connection with my students, but actually allowing them to be uh, connected 
globally. So what we did is we actually asked some uh, Korean students from South Korea school to critique the work, uh, their work, the, the, my students' work, and then they also provided some recommendations. So my students really enjoyed uh, interacting and then uh, it's really challenging, but it's fun because the students are really, sometimes they don't understand each other and then they try to find ways on how they will be able to communicate with one another. So you can also try that one. And then oh, the, the other one that I, I, I skipped is actually when we were creating, um, it's you now about the, the one I mentioned about uh, the, um, uh, this one is flow, sorry. This one is the flow of electricity. And then in the end, I asked them what alternative energy resource will actually work in the area. For example, why is Bangui windmills is really helping the people in Ilocos? So they need to do a research and really find out. So what if you live in Baguio? What could be the alternative energy resource that might work for for you? So that's the one. That, this one showed the solar uh the windmills also. Okay. Then the last one that I have here, um, in order to connect, the students will be able to connect and maintain connection with your content is to create digital portfolios. So at this time in the remote learning, it's good that we um, ask our students to really see the to come up with their own portfolio and find out at the end of the term how much or um, what are the developments that they were able to achieve in a term. And I'm sure that they will be proud of the things that they have accomplished while working online or offline with their teachers. So I hope you can also design your own, uh, the digital portfolios for your students. So are you still okay? I hope you're still okay. I'm on the last, um, I think, four or five slides already. So how will my students interact with other students? So we said we want to maintain connection. So not just with your content, but also with your classmates. So what we want to highlight now is to empower the, we want to leverage the power of collaboration. We want to highlight the culture of collaboration among our students. So it's not just among the teachers, but equally important is even though that there's, um, uh, we are not physically close to each other, but what we can we can make use of the different tech tools in order to collaborate. Okay? We want to be connected with, we want our students to be connected with their classmates. So there are so many tech tools that we can use. So for example, as I mentioned, we're using Hangouts. So for the students, if they have homework, if they have the project and they want to discuss it, I created, a, if it's a group, I created several groups in my Hangouts and then the groups will only chat and send messages in that in that group chat. So they work together, but it's important that the teacher is always present in the, in the group. And then you can also create discussion forums in your learning management system so the students can interact, the students can agree, disagree with the, with the uh, explanation of their classmates and there are some tech tools that will allow the students to have peer reviews or group projects so we just need to explore them like google docs or google slides or powerpoint online or word online they are all working uh, in order to help us to to collaborate online okay so if you have some questions please be ready with them because i'll have the, the last part then later on we'll try to answer those questions so how will my students interact with me the teacher so what we want to highlight now is to make sure that you provide an avenue for communication so one thing that we do is we give a um, little time so let's say for seven minutes or five minutes the students will enter the the meet the virtual classroom and then chit chat with the teacher or to to just talk with their classmate i'll i, I allow them to turn on their cam their their um mic and then they can talk at least to have the personal level of 
talking and discussion so that they feel connected. And then with that, because they know each other, even though that we are in the virtual classroom, we were able to create a community. So it's not just like a virtual classroom. It becomes the community of learners where when we provide feedback or clarification, they get to um, be involved and be engaged and they join because they know each other so they don't feel they they won't feel shy anymore because they know oh that's my classmate oh i know his name already but i haven't met him when we were in school so those are some of the things that they they say when they are talking before the class or after the class so how can you maintain that you can create the three kinds of conferences advice reflection and the mastery so when we say advice when the students are working on a project or lessons you empower your students to ask for advice ask few questions so you always motivate them do you have any question is there anything that you want to ask me or to tell me so that's the advice conference and then you can you also need to encourage your students to reflect so empower them to reflect on their own learning what worked well what didn't work okay and how i can how can i improve it in the next uh, for the uh, next time and the last one is the mastery conference so this time you're not going to ad give advice you're not going to ask your students to uh, uh, reflect on their work but this time because you have given enough feedback then you have the mastery ask them to or look at the rubric that i have prepared and i want you to look at your own work and find out uh how do you how do you see it how do you fare your own how do you how are you going to grade or rate your own work okay so that's the three kind of conferences that you can set during your asynchronous session with your students then of course um these things are all happening because of the COVID, right but i found out that the COVID is also the answer to the challenges that we are experiencing so what are this COVID? so try to communicate and collaborate if there are so many challenges that it's difficult for you to handle this is the best time that you collaborate with your colleagues and it's also the best time to communicate with the parents of your children of your your students because this is where we see the strong partnership of the home and the school at this time of the remote learning so communicate and collaborate then also be sure to be organized there are so many things that you want to include oh i want this video oh i want this this tactos but be sure to remember that less is more so try to organize this, go to the simplest one, and then later on, gradually, then you can include all the other rich ideas that you have. And then, of course, from time to time, it's important to visit your continuity learning, continuity learning plan, continuity of learning plan. So this one will make you or stay, uh, help you stay focused because there are so many ideas, but what do we need for now what does it say in our in our and the the what's the direction of our school so you need to take note of these things and then later on then uh, we have your own goals you have so many ideas then you check your clp and then it's a time that you integrate all these things and find out what will best work for your class and then of course don't hesitate to experiment so um, if you try a new thing and then you fail and then you can celebrate that and say woohoo i failed and so i'll try another another strategy it didn't work the way i wanted uh, it so maybe I, if i try this thing it will work so it's okay we we try to celebrate the failures as much as we celebrate our successes right so take note of the COVID, communicate or collaborate organize visit your clp integrate and don't hesitate so as a science teacher i love experimenting so i really i would really advise you to keep on experimenting because this is the big question of how can i use limitations to spark creativity this is where the resourcefulness and the creativity of teachers come in right when when uh, this is when you innovate when you don't have the best technology 
So when we do that, we experiment. So we're all like science teachers. So it's okay to fail and always go back what went wrong and how you can improve it. Okay, so I think that's the end. So thank you. And again, uh, as a LaSalle teacher, I always tell that even if I'm not the light, I can be the spark to start the change that I want to see. Okay, so I do hope that this little sharing that I have today will at least help you um, and, and really excite you to embark the the new academic year for for your students and in order to help our students also to cope at this time at uh, this challenging time okay so again thank you i'm winnie diola and if you want to connect with me i have my email address and my facebook so kindly uh, if you have questions uh, kindly send me a message Thank you and good morning.